All right, if you have your Bibles this morning, we'll be looking at Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. One man wrote a poem entitled, You Tell on Yourself, and this is what it says. You tell what you are by the friends you seek, by the very manner in which you speak, by the way you employ your leisure time, by the use you make of dollar and dime. You tell what you are by the things you wear, by the spirit in which you bur your burdens bear, by the kind of things at which you laugh, by records or, or CDs, uh, you play on the phonograph, as you can tell, it was written a while ago. You tell what you are by the way you walk, by the things of which you delight to talk, by the manner in which you bear defeat, by so simple a thing as how you eat, by the books you choose from the well-filled shelf. And these ways and more you tell on yourself. So there is really no particle of sense in an effort to keep up false Pretense. We're going to be speaking with that in mind this morning. Look at verse 1 of Ephesians chapter 4. If you don't have a Bible, please make sure you're near somebody or try to get, uh, if you're in the back section, what we call pew Bibles. There's some pew Bibles there and you can grab it. But in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 1 specifically, and this is where we'll take our thought for this morning. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you... And what is he beseeching us? That word beseech means to beg or to plead with us. What is he pleading with the church of Ephesus? That ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. There was a, a small boy and he asked, he was going to play at a park. And so he came up to this uh, lady who was sitting on a bench at the park. And he said, hey, do you, do, do you believe in God? Do you believe God? And the lady was kind of taken back, and she was like, well, yeah, I do. And on hearing that answer, the little boy said, good, can you keep my money and my watch while I play? Now, obviously, that boy felt that believing in God affected her behavior. Okay, so he was worried about leaving his money and his watch with somebody who didn't believe in God. All right, that's what he was, where he was. And so his simple mind said, obviously, if she believes in God, she's not going to take my money and my watch, go uh, hawk it all, or hawk my watch, make some more money and take, and uh, uh, I'll never see this again. So in his idea, he felt that belief and behavior belonged together. So did the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul, in his letters in his letter to the Ephesians, he follows up his instructions. Remember that we've been trying to help you in understanding the book of Ephesians in chapter 1 and chapter 2, chapter 3. Very common with the way the Apostle Paul taught as he gets heavy into doctrine. And doctrinally, doctrinally, remember what we told you, one of the key phrases in the book of Ephesians is in Christ. And a couple weeks ago when we were talking about it, what we indicated is that he was telling us, hey, you are in Christ, you're in the heavenlies. But now what he's going to start turning it to us and start saying, yes, we're in the heavenlies, we're in Christ, we've been redeemed, it's by grace you, sa you are saved. It's that not of yourselves. Man, it's a gift of God. He tells us all of this about our great salvation and some of the wonders of salvation. But now he says, here's where the rubber meets the road. Because you've been saved, walk worthily. Walk like it. This morning, I want to look at a couple ideas out of our context because what Paul is instructing us to do is saying, hey, don't just mouth the words that you're a Christian. You make sure that your life matches up what you are saying. That's what the Bible is saying. And that's why I love the, the Bible. The Bible is so transparent. It's so great for us because it not only tells us theologically, it not only tells us where to rest our faith, but it also tells us how to act out our faith. And this morning, I want us to look at this idea of walking worthy. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would help us this morning as we look at Scripture. Give us wisdom and guidance. Lord, we love the Bible here. We love Scripture. 
Lord, without it, we'd be lost. Without it, we'd have no direction. We thank you for preserving the word of God for us so that as a people who forsook you way back in our father and mother, Adam and Eve, Lord, in your perfect plan, you sent Jesus Christ to die for us. And through the word of God, we hear of that wonderful salvation. And Lord, we thank you that we can partake of that salvation. But Lord, on this earth, you don't leave us alone. You have given us the Holy Spirit and you've given us the written word of God to guide us. And I pray as we come to the pages of scripture this morning, that you would do that which I can't, and that is speak to hearts. And we ask and claim your power in Jesus' name. Amen. So here we have a couple of ideas right here in our text. The word walk is used in Ephesians. It's actually for the Apostle Paul. He uses it often in other books. But just in the book of Ephesians, you find it used many times. So our first instruction as far as walking worthy is that Christians should walk worthily. Look at what it says in verse 1 um, of chapter 4. I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation where you, where, with your calm. Notice back in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. For we are his workmanship created, here's his word again, in Christ Jesus. Unto good works, which hath before, uh, hath before ordained that we should, what should we do? We should walk in them. Look at um, one, chapter 4 and verse 1. We see it there. Look at chapter 4 and verse 17. Chapter 4 and verse 17. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk. So how do they walk? In the vanity of their mind. Look at chapter 5 and verse 2. And walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and given, us, uh, given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. Look at uh, chapter 5 and verse 8. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. Look at verse 15. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. So the Apostle Paul in the book of Ephesians, guess what? He is interested not just how you talk, but he's interested in how we walk. And that's what we're going to consider this morning. What's your walk like? Does it match up with your talk? Can somebody follow you around and say, oh, you know what? They are a Christian. They are a Christian because they walk in light. They walk worthy of the calling that we've been called with. Christians should walk worthily. In uh, chapter 5, remember in uh, chapter 4 we're there, but notice in chapter 5 and verse 1 and 2, be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. He's still using this idea of walking. And in verse 2, what does he say? Walk in love. He says there's a difference in how you walk. Verse 8, he says you were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. So in chapter 5, in chapter 4, he begins this conversation of walking. Chapter 5, he explains some of the difference between the walks of this world. In verse 3 through about 7, he tells us of how we used to walk. That's the pagan walk. All right, the pagan walk. How does the pagan walk? And by pagan, what do we mean by that? We mean somebody that does not know Jesus Christ. They do not claim Jesus Christ as their Savior. So how does, we would call that the world. So how does the world walk? Look at verse 3. But fornication. Fornication is immorality. All uncleanness, covetous. Let it not be once named among you as become a saint's. So what he's saying is immorality and covetousness and uncleanness. That isn't supposed to be in somebody that walks in light. That's a worldly walk. I asked you this morning, 
So if you are participating in immoral acts, and I'm not trying to get crude here this morning, but it is very common in our society for people to come to church on Sunday morning, and by Sunday afternoon, they're immoral. By Monday, they're immoral. Don't claim that you walk in light. Don't claim that you know Jesus Christ is your Savior. You know, you need to stop it. Why? Because you're not walking in the light. You're walking as a worldly person. And it's wrong. And our society may condone it. Our, our society may put a stamp of approval on it and say, it's okay. It doesn't matter. We, we adhere to a higher calling. It's a worthy calling. And that is what Ephesians is telling us. Paul is saying, walk worthy. You are called. You're not called by Satan. You're not called by the prince of the power of the air anymore. You're called by Jesus Christ. You have a higher calling. And live morally. Don't walk as a worldly person. Look at verse 4. Neither filthiness nor foolish talking. I know I was talking with some of our young people a couple of weeks ago that go to public school and they were talking about lunch and how at lunch they basically sit by themselves. You know why? Because of the filthy, foolish talking. Filthiness. If you're a young person here and you're involved with that, if you're an older person and all that comes out of your mouth is filth, I'm sorry, according to this, you better check your salvation, bud. You better check it. Because foolish talking and filthy talking should not be for somebody that says, I walk in light. There's something wrong with us when all that can come out of our mouth is a cuss word. There's something wrong with us when all that comes out of our mouth is some, uh, is some bad vulgar language. Even this week, even in our own school, a couple of knuckleheads wanted to use foul language. And this is what I say to you young people that want to use foul language. You're not walking in light. There's darkness in your soul. You need to bow before Jesus Christ and say, what's wrong with me? You have allowed darkness to come in your soul. Walk as children of light. What does the Bible say? Filthiness, foolish talking, and foolish jesting. And I'm not saying we can't joke. You know, even, even it's my personality. I have a sarcastic personality. It's a gift. You know what I mean? It's a gift. It's somewhere... Uh, it's somewhere there in, in Ephesians, I believe. It's one of the fruit of the Spirit. I think it's in the Greek there. But I love joking. I love having a good time. But foolish jesting? What does that mean? It's jesting and foolishly, foolishly taking the sacred things of the Lord, making light of it. Making, making light of the sacred things, making light of the cross. Making light of our Savior, that can be foolishness. But it also can be foolishness and, and talking about those things that uh, basically shouldn't be talked about in a jesting way. And that is uh, the sacredness. You know, the Bible says there's this sacredness in marriage. And what, is our, what does our society do? They foolishly jest about morals. It's wrong. It's wrong. We should be. You know, it, it's, a, it's a knock to say, oh, you're so pious and prude. So what's the opposite of that? Well, being a f filthy, crude person. I'm sorry. I guess I'll be pious and prude instead of like you. <laughs> I mean, it's just, I mean, well, you know, I'm going to be filthy and crude? No. Why? Because we walk as children of light. The Bible says, neither filthiness nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know that no whoremonger, nor unclean persons, nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be ye not therefore partakers with them. So what is another sign that I'm walking in darkness. All right, my talk, my thoughts, 
But it also says here that I'm disobedient. I'm disobedient. I was uh, thinking about this recently, and uh, even we mentioned this, I think, in the month of September on a Sunday night, this concept of obedience. You know, the Bible... The Bible has a lot of, you might call them rules, if you don't, if you don't like godliness, uh, you're critical about godliness, and you're, um, you're saying, oh, you know, I, I don't like the, the God thing and God's word, and so you may call them rules. That's fine. Call them rules. I call it guidelines to live by. Everybody has guidelines, just so you know. You're obeying somebody. <laughs> you're obeying somebody. It may be yourself. Probably more than likely it's Satan. And just so you know, he ain't really a good boss. All right, he's a loser, first of all. all right? he, he got his head kicked in by Jesus, just so you know. All right? he got his, uh, and he's going to get thumped at the end of time. Why? Because I know the end of the story. Okay? So he's a loser. So hang out with him all you want. All right? I like hanging out with winners. All right? And so here, here you may say, oh, it's just a bunch of rules. It's guidelines. But this is what I can tell you as a Christian, a good Christian here this morning. You, you want to walk as children of light? And God says, maybe you're praying, and God says to read your Bible. I think, actually, the Bible commands us to read it daily, just so you know. I, I, I think I have Scripture to back it up. Paul, uh, David even said morning, noon, and night, All right, that he, he prayed and cried aloud to the Lord. I think daily I need to do it, but I know this. There needs to be a relationship with Christ. So if you're sitting here and you say, ah, I'm not going to do it. This is what I can tell you. You're walking in disobedience and you hate God. You're just, oh, you can't say that. Well, if you love me, keep my commandments. So if I'm not keeping my command, his commandments, what do I? I don't love him. Sorry, the opposite of love is hate. So now you're saying, well, wait a minute, I, I, I sin. I'm not saying, but if you have, I'm not saying that you can't sin once in a while. I, I, I sin, right? I understand that, and I've got to come to God. But it is not my desire to disobey God on a daily basis. It is not my desire to wake up in the morning and say, you know what, whatever God tells me to do, I ain't doing it. That is not the attitude of somebody that is walking in light. You are walking as a pagan, walking as a worldly person. You are, you are not, you are not supposed to follow the children of disobedience because guess what follows the children of disobedience? The wrath of God. And you wonder why the blessing of God isn't on your life. You wonder why there is no, there's no peace, there's no joy, there's no comfort. Why is that there? Because you're disobeying God's way. And when you disobey God's way, guess what happens? The wrath of God comes upon you. This morning, it may be that you're unsaved. You say, well, what do you mean by being unsaved? Well, you never came to a point that you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. Jesus Christ is the only way to salvation. See, the children of disobedience, that's the world. Guess what they've, got, they've done? They've come up with all kinds of ways to get saved. So one way that even an unsaved person can obey is to obey God in the way of salvation. Jesus said, I am the way. He's the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That's Jesus Christ. So the world, the pagans have come up with all kinds of way. And in their disobedience, they say, I'm going to get to heaven. No, they won't. They will not get to heaven. Why? Because Jesus is the, is the way, and by obedience, I bow and I humble myself to the Almighty God and His way, and through Jesus Christ, then I get saved. This morning, you may not be saved. During the invitation time, my challenge to you would be then, come to Jesus and get saved. Come to Jesus and get saved. So the first thing we see is that Christians walk worthily. In chapter 5 and verses 3 through 8, we see that the pagans walk in darkness. But in verses 8 through 14, in chapter 5, the Bible tells us that Christians walk in light. 
They walk in light. For we were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. And then it tells us the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. It is a shame to even speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light, for whatsoever doth make manifest is light. This is what it's telling you and I. When we get saved, I have light inside and light. Light cast away darkness. Light and darkness, just so you know, they don't mix. Light and darkness. When we turn the lights on, darkness leaves. Light and darkness don't go together. And so Christianity and non-Christianity don't go together. And when you're saved, something happens inside. And that light takes over and it's shooing out the darkness. It doesn't want to hang out. Just like I was telling my Sunday school class this morning. Something happens when you're saved. You can't explain it all. But something happens. And guess what happens? Pretty soon, inside, you don't, you don't want to drink like you used to drink alcohol. You don't want to do those things. You, the music even, there's a, the appetites start changing. Why? Because light came into your soul. And it's casting away the darkness. And it's glorious when the light of the glorious gospel comes into our heart. So the first thing that Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4 is that we need to learn to walk worthily. And he explains that. But notice the second thing that he tells us in verses 3. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. So the second thing that he says will make us walk worthy as a church. Remember, this is to the church of Ephesus. He says, the first thing I want you to do is I want you to get your walk right. I don't want you to walk in a worldly way, in a pagan way. I want you to walk in light. There's a new walk. All right? It's a new strut. All right? Some of you. And guess what? Just, I'm just throwing it out there. The Christian strut, his pants are up. I'm just throwing it out there, just letting you know. All right? Because uh, he's moral. All right? But anyways, so that's a, it's a new strut. He's able to walk normal. Okay? So he, he walks in a right fashion. But notice what he says Secondly, and this is written to a church. So the first thing is my walk is right. It's in the light. The second thing, Christians first walk worthy, worthily. Second, Christians maintain unity. You say, well, wait a minute. Yes, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. And then he gives us seven one statements. Seven one statements. One body. One spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. I think he's trying to give us the idea as a church that we should be unified. We should be one. I know. I was talking with somebody recently, and they were crabbing. I actually, my wife and I were joking about it because it's actually a good thing. All right, they didn't think of it as a good thing, but they were, they were talking like, you know what, um, you know, I, I don't understand it. It just seems like everybody, everybody agrees with you or everybody does this. I'm like, yeah, so are you mad because as a church we're unified? Well, praise the Lord. I guess that we're not devilish. <laughs> Hallelujah. Right? I, I'm happy for that. There should be unity in a church. There shouldn't be divisions. There shouldn't be arguing and screaming and yelling and saying, well, I'm not going to hang out with them. And I don't like them and I don't like that. That's a bad spirit in a church. And the Bible says that guess what happens when, when we walk properly and we walk in light, there is a unity that comes in and that's what God desires in a church. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit. But notice, he tells us what we're supposed to be unified in. All right? That's what I, I like about the Bible. In, in verses 1 and 2, he says, hey, you're walking worthy. 
You're lowly and you're uh, lowly in mind and meekness with long suffering. But notice, we're unified in our calling. It's a divine calling. I'm just, just um, there's people out there, and it's this is kind of the world, and we're all like, <laughs> we just we're just unified about what? Just so you know, I want to know what I'm unified about. The Bible doesn't tell me just to have unity for no cause. It says I'm unified in my divine calling. I'm unified, and as a church, the reason there's unity is because Christ called us. It's not, just, it's not just some ridiculous movement out there. It's I'm unified under Christ. That's one. And then he continues on in verses 3 through 6. And I'm, I'm unified, or I have unity in verse 2 and 3 in a Christ-like conduct. What does he say? With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity, what? Of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So not only am I unified in a divine calling, but I'm unified in a Christ-like conduct. Who am I supposed to be exemplifying? Christ. Every one of those words is found in the gospel about Jesus Christ. Every one of them. And it's also found even in the, uh, the Apostle Paul writings about Christ. He was lowly. He was meek. He was long-suffering. He was forbearing. He, he wanted to keep the bond of peace. So this is what I tell us as a church. We just aren't unified for any cause. Oh, I'm unified. No, I ain't unified against, I, I am not unified against righteousness. No, sorry. Oh, I'll be unified against the devil. I'll be unified to fight against sin. I'll be unified if you are for Christ. But this is what I can tell you. You cross the line and you're for the devil, I'll kick your teeth in. You say, oh, that is so harsh. Oh, yeah, it is. I hope you never read the Old Testament. I hope you don't, because some people think I'm crazy, I'm wild. This is, I have never been like Moses. I have never ground up. I didn't go down to the Catholic Church, grab their little Mary, melt him down, or melt her down, sorry. All right, melt her down, grind it up, and put it in some mixture and say, drink it, dudes. I've never did that. But guess what Moses did? They made, they made an altar. Remember that, the golden calf? He melted it down, mixed it up with some Kool-Aid, right, and said, drink it, guys. Now guess what? Then after that, he said, okay. So you guys over here, you're choosing that? Kill him. And he walked away. Kill him. I haven't done that in church yet. I mean, they're like, all right, choose you this day who you will serve. We draw a line, which side, and then we all, all right, and, and I've let the, you know, I might have had some inside, inside knowledge, and so I asked a bunch of the guys that kind of I knew that were for Christ, said, hey, come packing. And I said, all right, you guys, you don't, you want to serve the devil? All right, shoot them. All right, and walk out. Like, oh, you can't do that. All right, but this is what I can tell you. My unity with the brethren stops when you go against Christ. Right. It's done. Yes. I am only unified. When I, am, when I have unity with the divine calling and, I have uni and I'm unified with a code of conduct and the code of conduct is living by Christ's code of conduct. Right. But you also see this in the passage in verse 3, 4, 5, 6, it says, also, I have unity in my confession of faith. One Lord, one body, one spirit, one baptism, one God and Father and all. You know what unifies us also as a church? Good, sound doctrine. You know what that is? That's teaching. Remember, the word doctrine just means teaching. So when I come to a place, I do want to know their doctrine. Doctrine, you know, there's some people that are like, oh, you know what? It's just doctrine, doctrine, doctrine. I'm sorry, you cannot practice godliness unless you know what godliness is. I'm sorry. So, yes, I want to be part of a church 
that teaches and teaches and teaches and teaches. I want to I wanna be part of a church that has a lot of doctrine and has a lot of teaching. I want as much Bible as I can get in me. Because it builds me, it strengthens me. And so we see that we're supposed to walk worthy. In verse 1, it tells me that I should walk worthily. Verse 3 through, or verse 2 and 3, it tells me that I should maintain unity. But verses um, 7 through 16, and we, don't, we won't have time to deal with it all. But it also says that as a church member, I should participate in ministry. That's what a good church does. It walks worthy. It maintains unity. And it participates in ministry. That's a good church. That's a good balance. What does it tell us here? This is a very well-known passage, verse 7. Notice what it says, and that's what we don't have time to get into all of it. But it tells us, but unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. I was studying this this week. And the, the Bible never ceases to amaze me. I've studied the Bible pretty intense for about 30 years. But you can never delve, you, you can never delve all that's in the well of the word of God. It's amazing to me. So here, that verse 8 is a quote from the book of Psalms. I should have figured that out, but somehow I missed it. Okay? It's a quote from Psalm 68. So if you have the chance, turn to Psalm 68. Psalm 68, most believe that this is a, a psalm written for the um, for, for when the the Ark of the Covenant was taken away and it was being brought back to the temple. It also, some say, that Psalm 68 was also a sung for kings when they came back and they were bearing gifts. All right, so they had gone away, they had spoiled the enemy, and they were bringing this back. And so some say even that this was sung while kings brought back their spoil. So look at Psalm 68. So that's the context. Notice um, verse 16. Why leap ye, ye high hills? This is the hill which God desires to dwell in. Yea, the Lord will dwell in it forever. So that's the idea of the Ark of the Covenant going back and it's going to dwell there. And that the Ark of the Covenant meant the presence of the Lord. So that's why they were really excited to get it back. Look at verse 17. The chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels. The Lord is among them as in Sinai in the holy place. Here's the quote. Thou hast ascended on high. Thou hast led captivity captive. Thou hast received gifts for men. Yea, for the rebellious also, that the Lord God might dwell among them. Look at verse 19. Blessed be the Lord who daily loadeth us with benefits, even the God of our salvation. So that's the context. And here Paul, under the inspiration of God, goes back to a psalm and pulls it. And where does he put it in the context? He puts it in the context of us as a church. And he's telling us as a church, hey, I want you to walk worthy. I want you to walk in light. Don't walk like the world. And make sure that you promote unity. Make sure you maintain that. And then make sure, make sure that you participate in ministry. And then he goes back to the Old Testament and he reminds us, of when kings would come or when the Ark of the Covenant was gone and it was coming back in and the presence of the Lord was wanted, it was desired and man, they were so excited that they wrote these words and they penned these words and said, man, here is our God who brought captivity captive and what does he come bearing? Gifts. And this is my challenge to you as we close this morning. So Christ said, and under the inspiration of Scripture, 
Paul reaches back and says that our king, King Jesus, and we know this according to Ephesians 5, just a chapter later. He tells us in Ephesians 5, Paul says that Jesus not only died for you as an individual, but he died for us sitting here as a church. The church is very special. And he wants us to walk in light. And he wants us to maintain unity. But Jesus, when he went up into heaven, and when he was, well, when he was on the cross, and he died on the cross, and he he uh, freed us. He led captivity. We were, he led captivity captive. Now this is what's interesting. Think about that phrase. He didn't say he made captives free. He, the captivity he delivered. <laughs> Most people don't talk like that. All right? So not, he led captivity captive. That's how free you are in Christ. There is nothing that can bind you anymore. Sin can't get a hold of you. And what he says is because as a church, I loved you and I want you to walk in light and I want you to have unity. I gave you gifts. And every person in here, I believe biblically, has a gift for us as a church. Every one of us. And you say, well, well who am I? I don't know. But Christ led captivity captive for you. He ascended up on high. And he doesn't leave you without a gift. And so guess what I do? I try to study that. I try to learn it. And I try to say, hey, so what gift do you have for this body of believers here this morning? Because God gave it to you. So that as a group of believers... When that gift is displayed, we all honor God more. That's the Bible. That's right in Scripture. It's also found in Corinthians. It's also found in Romans 12. That's the gifts that God gave. And when he died on the cross, he not only beat the devil and beat him to a pulp, but he delivered me and he said, now... I want you to be a part of a church, and here's a gift to give to that church. I'm not just talking about offerings. I'm talking about our service to the Lord. Did you see it in the context? Notice what it says in verse 11 and 12, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Notice what it says. He gave us those. Those are a gift. Did you know that pastors are a gift to the church? That's according to the context. But why are pastors gifts? So that we can go out soul winning? No, for the perfecting of the saints. That word perfecting, uh, for the edi and then it says for the, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. The word perfecting and edifying, there's a couple of terms in the, in the Greek. One of those terms, uh, they used it for a medical term. So when a doctor came in and there was a problem, they could perfect or edify. They could, they could uh, come in medically and repair something. The other one was like a tailor. Okay, so the idea of perfecting, it was a tailor term. So when you went into a tailor, guess he would, what he would do? He would outfit you perfectly if you were going to be a soldier, he would outfit you perfectly to go and be a soldier. If you were going to be, um, I, don't, I don't know, whatever it may be, he would outfit you. It has the idea that you are being fitted perfectly for your task. So guess what God gave us? God gave us a church. And in the church, we learn to walk right in the light. And we're supposed to be unified but then also he gave us gifts and one of them is pastors so that we can not just sit, excuse my vernacular, sit on your duff and do nada. He gave you a pastor to say, hey, you're not doing right. That's sometimes. But also he gave us pastors to say, get out there and win the lost. 
He gave us pastors so that within ourselves we can minister and we have Sunday school teachers. We have nursery workers. We have, we have nursing homes that need that we're out in. We have bus routes and it may be you say, well, what is my gift? And maybe just getting on a bus and driving it. But God gives our church gifts. And what type of person would you be? Jesus gave us an illustration. What type of person would you be if you took your gift, you dug a hole, and you buried it? I call that a selfish Christian. And this morning, that's my challenge then. If you're walking in the light, and you're supposed to maintain unity, so what ministry are you participating in? Because according to Paul, that is evidence of a godly church. A godly church walks in the light, it maintains unity, but they also, as a church, are participating in ministry. What is that ministry? What's the word ministry mean? Serving. Serving. So how have you served the church this week? You're like, oh, no, no, oh, wait a minute. I came in and I was looking around and I wanted to know all the amenities. So, oh, Sunday school program? How many grades? Right, some of you, you're, you're, you're shopping for a church. You're looking for a church and saying, well, what is it going to offer me instead of you saying, what can I do? Because God saved me and he shed his blood for this place and God has a gift that he's given to me and I want to use it in the church. That's what God desires of every believer. Don't be a selfish believer. Be a, be a Christian that walks worthy. That's about it.